Come with me to a magical place where being labeled the pork queen is a compliment, where being nice is just a way of life, and where all leaders of the free world must pass through. Welcome to Iowa. Whether you're a current Iowan, an Iowa expat, or an Iowan at heart, this show is for you. This is the Iowa Podcast. Real Iowans, real talk, no drama. I'm Justin Brady in the Brady Dental Care Studio, and today I'm joined with Dr. Michael Abramoff, the founder of Digital Diagnostics, and I should also say you're a retinal surgeon, so thank you so much for coming on the Iowa Podcast. I appreciate it. Well, it's great to, that you're having me, Justin, and I'm uh, looking forward to, uh, to this conversation. So we've actually spoken in the past at my former employer with iHeart and WHO Radio, so it's good to see you again. And uh, Dr. Abramoff is an AI specialist. He's a retinal surgeon. So who better to talk about AI regulation in healthcare than you, of course. Everybody, every week we bring you an incredible Iowan doing something amazing and bringing you critical information. So if you like that kind of thing, if you're a weird person that likes to be informed, make sure to subscribe. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeart, pretty much every player under the sun, except those weird ones that have like 10 users. We're not on those players, but you can always go to iowapodcast.com as well. So, uh, Dr. Abramoff, I think it's probably best, because uh, this is a bit of a, it can get to be a hairy and technical topic, so I think it would probably be best to start with Luminetics Core. Now, this used to be called IDX. Um it's basically, I want to break this down as simple as possible, but it's an AI doctor. Essentially, it's an AI eye doctor. Is that, is that kind of a fair assessment to break it down that much? It's a little <laughs> bit more subtle than that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so, but let's go. So, it is an AI. We call it autonomous because yes. it makes the medical decision that doctors typically make, it makes a medical decision by itself. So yeah. there's no doctor involved in a medical decision. That's why it's an AI. Um, it does a very specific thing. So you think of as a doctor probably can diagnose many different diseases, treat yeah. many different diseases. This is made today, luminetic score for a single disease, but that happens to be the most important cause of blindness in the US. And that is? Diabetic retinopathy, which is yeah. a complication of diabetes and about... 10 to 15% of people in the U.S., and it's a little bit higher in, the, in Iowa, actually, uh, have diabetes, and all of them are at risk of getting this complication and losing vision because of it. Yeah, okay, so it's basically an AI that is scanning for, detecting, and trying to find early signs of this disease. Exactly, right? so yeah, it, yeah. it diagnoses disease in a stage where people have no symptoms, meaning... They, they won't have any complaints of blurry vision or anything. They, they just think they're fine. Yeah. They know they have diabetes. And a diabetic eye exam can find this disease in a stage where you can still treat it so that people don't lose their vision. If it comes later and people start having symptoms, many times retina specialists and ophthalmologists and optometrists like me will say, oh, you know, we can still try to do what we can, but it's pretty late and you probably have irreversible vision loss. Right. So it, it's key because as I was reading up on all the documentation, it, it's incredible technology because if caught early, there's a lot you can do about it, right? Exactly. And so the, right now we, we know really well how to treat it. I mean, there's always new treatments and even better treatments coming out, but we know so well how to treat it. The biggest problem with diabetes is that people are not getting to, to people like me, to, to retina specialists, ophthalmologists like me, we can actually treat it in an early stage. And, and so the diabetic eye exam or screening, as many people call it, is important for everyone with diabetes every year because now we can find a disease. And if, 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 if the patient doesn't have it, if you do have it, that's about 5 to 10% of cases, then yeah, you, need, you may need treatment. And that's the time to actually be managed and treated by, by a specialist. Yeah. But, but, but again, the problem is that people are not going to these exams and so we're missing it and so they, they never have the exam, and then they show up, and it's already in a very late stage, and, and now it's very hard. So <laughs> people, um, they do go for the diabetes management, yeah, yeah, but they do not get for this eye exam because it's a hassle, mm. especially in a place like rural Iowa. Mm -hmm. You may have to travel four to six hours to see someone like me. Now you sit in the waiting room for half a day, 
uh, you spend time there, you maybe spend one minute with, with someone like me, I look in your eyes and typically it's it's fine. Yeah, right. So it's 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 a copay, it's expensive, it's a lot of time lost from, from a job or for the children or for childcare or whatever. Um, there's just many, many reasons why people don't go, but they do not end up going. So almost 80%, 85%, of people with diabetes do not have their eye exams. When we wow. know it's cool. so important. Okay. When we know it can present vision loss and blindness. So is the future here you can put, um, and I'm still, I still remember this thing as IDX, so I have to like adjust too. Is the future here you can put Illuminetics core all over the place, and because it's autonomous AI doing this on its own, eventually that can lower the cost of these exams. Is this the idea here? The goal is to lower the cost yeah. and especially make it more accessible, like we call it now for health equity, which is sure. that yeah. everyone can access these diabetic eye exams in an, in an easy manner. And so that was always the goal. So for that, that's why the word autonomous or by itself is so important because when you think about many AIs, they help doctors, but people don't go to the doctor in the first place. That's the big problem. Mm, so you need mm -hmm. to be where the patient is hmm. and so that the patient doesn't have to come to a retina specialist or an ophthalmologist anymore. So that was the trick that we made the AI autonomous and be able to make this diagnosis by itself where now the people are getting their diabetes management, which is in primary care or maybe a lab. We are actually in some grocery stores where people get a diabetes management and they also get the autonomous Wait, well, diabetic you, eye exam. You said you are in grocery stores or want to be? In several states in, in, in Delaware. So. Hold on. Okay, so wait a minute. I didn't know that. So Luminetics Core right now is in a few grocery stores. Yes. So you could just walk up to a grocery store and get an eye exam for diabetic retinopathy. If you have diabetes yeah. and there is a doctor saying, yeah, you need an eye exam, they will give you, a, you know, they'll prescribe it, they will order it and you get a test. And uh, and within minutes, you will know whether or not you have the disease. Okay, so there's a lot to follow. That's, I didn't know that. There's a lot to follow up on that. Uh, it, th this is kind of, you're illustrating the why people are pouring so much money into AI and healthcare. I think your own report, and you, if I got this right, it's somewhere around $260 billion by 2025 investment into AI and healthcare. Does that sound about right? That sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's in the... Yeah, I, just, meeting, yeah. Yeah, I read it, but I'm, I think that's generally right. So um, what other examples? Because basically what the technology is doing is looking for early signs. Uh, AI is really good at this. It's really good at repeated patterns for those that don't know. Um, is this same principle in AI, like early detection of, in this case, a retinal disease... Is that apply to like skin cancer and any other area like breast cancer? Are there other examples where AI is being used as an early detection method? Exactly where we want to go. And this yeah, is stretch goal, yeah. right? So we were the first in any field of medicine to be able to do that. And for the FDA to say, you can do this. And for CMS and Medicare and payers like uh, Blue Mark, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield to, to, to reimburse it. But the goal is, of course, to have this for many diseases. There's many cases where people do not have access to high quality healthcare. It's available, mm -hmm. but for a variety of reasons, some of which we went into, they don't go. They end up not going. That's for heart disease, for skin disease, like you mentioned. There's so many of those that we and others are working on to bring to market and to bring to benefit patients. Because ultimately, the goal of all of this is to have better outcomes for patients, mm -hmm. yeah. to have lower costs better access, better health equity. You know, all of these are achievable with AI, especially where, like you said, it's highly scalable, right? Right. Yeah. For a disease which only a few people have and you only need to diagnose a few people per year, probably not greatly suited. But where there's massive millions of people like with diabetes, with heart disease, or at risk of the disease, that's where it comes in and that's the, where it will be most beneficial so to all right, of us. Yeah, no, 100%. So right now it's about... Uh, the retina right mm -hmm. now, but in the future, are you planning on adding more services like scanning for breast cancer or doing, I, I don't know if scanning is the right word. It's probably not the right te technical term, but uh, in the future, are you looking at early detection of other diseases using AI that um, digital diagnostics has built? Given the, the expertise future? we have, we started with yeah. other diseases in the eye. You can think of glaucoma, yeah, AMD. Right. Sure. But there's sure. also what is interesting about the retina, the back of the eye, is that you can see essentially what the brain, what our brain looks like, what the blood vessels in the brain look like, what the neural really? cells in the look, look like, without radiation, without doing a scan or whatever. So it also allows you to diagnose 
risk for cardiovascular disease, for a stroke or a myocardial infarct. Wow. So we're also using it and planning to use it for detecting those type of diseases. So that's the stretch goal within the eye where we have, you know, the, the already the camera we currently using and putting everywhere across the US and in fact across the world, we can talk about that. But also, and that's, you know, to your second question, other diseases in other organs like breast cancer, uh, the skin, other organs, absolutely want to go there. But we decided to first of all, use the, 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 the footprint, we call it, what we already have for, for the eye and for the retina to make sure we cover all diseases that, you know, where it's useful. How much training is necessary? Let's just talk about digi- um, your current, yeah, I'm still getting used to this, Luminetics Core. Let's just talk about that. How much training is required for someone to utilize that? I mean, one of them's in a grocery store, so I can't imagine there's hardly any training. That was so important when we developed it because there's two things about the AI. There's the diagnostic AI, which makes a high quality diagnosis, which is actually more accurate than a retina specialist like me. So that's important. And we, we can go into exactly why that is and how we know that. But there's another aspect, which is, I already mentioned, it should be where a retina specialist is not. It needs to be in primary care. And like you said, a grocery store, a lab core, where people do not have experience with taking high quality images of the retina. That's hard. Yeah, You probably yeah. have never done that. No. <laughs> and so now we always... I, play. I can barely take high quality images of like birthday parties. So well, I would love to do a live a demo little... with you. I can make you do a high quality <laughs> eye exam probably within, you know, 20, 30 minutes. And so what we... What we made it about this AI is also that it's really too easy to use with any mm-hmm. anyone mm-hmm. with a high school graduation. So it was part wow. of the clinical trial we designed with FDA. So what we say now is it takes about four hours of training for anyone to be certified and be you know to have the the expertise to take high quality images that the AI is then able to diagnose. That was really 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 important for FDA. Yeah but yeah. also for payers like CMS for Medicare right. to make sure that, the, that the, the quality of the diagnosis is high and it's actually achievable by anyone in those clinics. If you just make it available to very, you know, exp- with a lot of expertise like academic centers like the University of Iowa or Stanford or Hopkins, then you're not doing anything about health equity right. because it needs to be everywhere. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it's, in, it's incredible. Because I'm, I'm assuming the future, because you, you just kind of gave a, a hint uh, at, at what the future looks like. And um, you know, in grocery stores, for example, I, I think back to, I don't even know if these are still around, but like those old blood pressure machines in like Walgreens where you sat in that little booth and then a little, you put your arm through the thing and it tells you your blood pressure. I'm kind of looking into the future here and I'm seeing a device that kind of resembles that. You sit down for like five minutes and there you go. Your yearly health evaluation was just conducted by AI. It cost you like $10 and it was like 200 times better than a doctor visit, right? That's kind of what I'm seeing. Might I don't even know what that's possible now, but how good, because I know this is the big question that people think of. They're like, we have an AI over here. We have Dr. Abramoff over here. I'd prefer Dr. Abramoff to do my scan, my, my check. Um, because he's trained and I don't know what I'm getting with an AI. So how good, and I think I know the answer to this, but how good is the Luminetics core in doing these screenings versus you? Like who wins? I'm, it's more accurate than, than a, a pretty experienced retina specialist. It's like more me. accurate than an experienced retina specialist. We showed it specialist. in a clinical trial. So with FDA, wow, yeah. we worked for eight years on how to prove the safety, how to prove that there's no racial ethnic bias. That was really important. Mm. Uh, how to prove that it's you know efficient. And so we designed a trial where we tested that and we actually didn't even compare it to clinicians. We compared it to what is called clinical outcome, mm-hmm. whether oh. the patient is going to go blind without treatment or not, whether they're going to lose vision with, without treatment or not. So we looked at that and that's why also we are, can, can say it's better. If you oh. compare it to physicians, which is typically done with AI, with you know, experienced clinicians, you can just say it's it's not worse. It's, yeah. it, it corresponds highly. You cannot say it's better. We can because we did the clinical trial that way. Okay. So if you say, well, I'm not sure about my doctor versus the AI, A, you know, I, the, the AI is where I am not. So you still have to spend six hours. And if you want, yeah. you can still do that, right? <laughs> That's you may true. have to That's wait a, a few point. months. You don't have to, yeah, you don't you have, have to go to the AI, right? Yeah. And so there's, 
there's the convenience. And then if the FDA signs off on it <laughs> and insurance signs off on it, that this is safe and effective and we trust this, well, maybe you can think so about it. <laughs> You're starting to see it about, now the majority of people already prefer AI to a diagnosis if it's FDA authorized, FDA uh-huh. approved. Real, what, real, really? The majority of people prefer Yeah, we're an starting AI. to see these numbers in studies really? we haven't done, but are, that have been published. Wow, so, already. Yeah. That's actually pretty fast adoption. So just to, to be really clear, if there was like a competition, because you need a, at least someone to run the machine, at least. So if there was a competition, recent high school grad is sitting at the machine, and there's a line of 100 people, and some have diabetic ret- retinopathy, early signs, some don't. And then there's another line of people that's waiting for you. Who wins that competition? Who's faster and who is more accurate? You're the AI you guys created or you? Well, we already showed that the AI is more accurate for <laughs> this specific disease. Don't forget. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm a retina specialist. <laughs> yes. I diagnose many diseases Just, I love, yeah. and, and I can treat them. Right. That is not, that is not a fair competition for <laughs> this specific <laughs> diabetic eye exam. Yeah, yeah. It's more accurate. That's crazy. We, in fact, studied and did a randomized clinical trial about this question that you asked, what is more efficient? And we actually show that it's more efficient to do, do it with an AI than without, which is really exciting, I think, because the, one of the challenges in healthcare has been so far, it's really good. That's why I came to the US. It's really good here, but it's not accessible to many people. That's right. why you yep. get these health inequities. And so when you... And, and people have been trying to make physicians more productive, more accessible, has failed. I mean, mm-hmm. has, you know, throwing money at it has failed. Yep. And now with AI, we're actually doing that. We're starting to do that. So this isn't really a case of like replacing doctors. This is a, a case of uh, making doctors way, way faster so they can process more patients and they can improve patient outcomes and they can actually spend their time speaking with and working with patients instead of looking at charts all the time. Is that kind of where this is going? You're saying it's so much better than I think. But yeah, I would, I would say the same yeah. thing. That I, Again, if 80% of people with diabetes are not getting an eye exam and, yeah. and with AI they can, that's not replacing doctors. Like you say, now the patients who actually need the care of someone like me, you know, the treatments, the very specialized treatments, now we have time to give those rather than spend our time on patients who have nothing wrong with them. I do want to go back to, to that example you gave because, you know, we mentioned grocery stores. I think right now it's very important that this AI for chronic diseases like diabetes is still part of the healthcare system mm-hmm. because the, you, you mentioned the Walgreens and the, and the blood pressure machine. The blood pressure machine, yeah. And, and what, what, what the, which is great. The problem was that the, the blood pressure was measured and then nothing was done with it. Mm. And so with chronic right. diseases and management of chronic diseases, it's so <coughs> important that the patients come back and that you say, well, your blood pressure was too high. You need to do something. And they come back again and we check it again. Same with the diabetic eye exam. Mm-hmm. So right now, the focus is really in making sure it's embedded in management of chronic disease. Mm. And so that's why I mentioned, you know, you need a prescription right now. We still require that patients have their diabetes managed by a provider, a nurse mm-hmm. or a nurse practitioner or doctor, whoever, and then they get this diabetic eye exam, and then the result of the eye exam gets back to the provider so they can recommend oh. to the patient what happens. It's not like, oh, you go home, you get this diagnosis, and you go figure it out. Right now, we're that not right. ready for that. Right, Ultimately, right. that's the goal. We're not ready for that today. So ultimately, the goals have this all be completely self-managed. But, but you, right now there's you're, a you're lot we need to learn yeah, about yeah, how to totally interact with patients, how to make sure that patients are actually, how, how this works together. That is not an easy task. We're not ready right. for that. Right now it's autonomous in the diagnosis, but the result still goes back to the who is managing the chronic disease of that sure. patient. Yeah, that makes 100%. Yeah. That, that makes sense. So right now when you when they get a prescription for this, it comes back to their electronic medical records. For example, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and then their if primary you have these doctors kept in the loop. Yeah. AIs, you know, just sitting sitting somewhere and spitting out diagnoses, that doesn't help it the patient. It doesn't do anything. No. Right, right. It's the same thing about like, uh, you know, like a bunch of, I think they did a study on like Fitbit. I mean, I have one right here. Study on Fitbits where, you know, they figured getting your data back, getting how many, you know, steps you're getting per day would improve uh, people's fitness goals, which doesn't actually happen because they need to actually commit. They need to make changes or they need to have someone guiding them or they need to have a commitment to action, right? Just having the data doesn't actually help, but having someone that is uh, helping you, guiding you or making um, commitments, making action steps to 
do something with that data is a big is a big deal. There's a huge discussion there on the you know having too much data isn't necessarily a good thing. It's knowing what to do with it. So I totally get that. Um, uh, well, let, let, I, I just want to second yeah, that. Please, that please. Indeed, some patients know really well what questions to ask and exactly what to do with it. But, but most they're you know overwhelmed with the data. And, and they don't know what to do with it, and they need guidance. And also, essentially, you know, repeating the message is so important, like stopping smoking. It, 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 someone telling you to stop smoking typically doesn't work. Right. But if True. you take them by the hands and, and for years work with them, something like Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah. right? It's, it's holding them mm. by the hands and helping them. That is so important in chronic disease management. That's a great example. That's a really good example. So... Um, one of the things being hotly discussed right now is AI regulation. And we have a lot of people calling for it. You know, hey, this needs to be regulated. And truthfully, over the last couple hundred years, uh, we always call for regulations for giant moving things we don't understand. And so should aspects of AI be regulated? Should we be discussing regulations right now? Is it too early? What should those regulations look like? And I know that you've um, been to Congress, I think you've you've testified on various aspects of AI and healthcare at to Congress, I, I believe. Uh, and so, what is the general recommendation? And I, I you know, I'm, it's not a leading question. I honestly don't know. I know this is a hotly debated issue. So, what should lawmakers be doing about AI, specifically AI and healthcare? So, yes, I I, I work with Congress, and I'm in DC a lot. Continue to working with them on on both sides of the aisle. It, it's in fact been great. I'm very proud of the fact that, hey, this is an Iowa company, yeah, and 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 that I'm doing back something for people in Iowa who did so much for for me and my family when we came. So, a, it's an Iowa company, but b, it's a healthcare company, and autonomous AI, this AI that makes a medical decision without a human oversight, that happening legally was the first in healthcare. You cannot buy a self-driving car, an autonomous car. Mm-hmm. Today, that is not legal. There's experiments. Right. There's ideas. We're almost there. We have been almost there for a while now. <laughs> but, but the point is, <laughs> it's, true. it's not legal. Yeah. And healthcare is legal. And that was the first. Healthcare Very was first. First. John Deere recently came last year at CES with an autonomous tractor. Right. So John Deere, also an Iowa company in Waterloo, uh, they were the second. But... <laughs> There's not a lot of that. autonomous AI that is legal, and healthcare was the first. So why is that? Because typically people see healthcare as this horribly complicated, very difficult true. to change system, which is true, true in yeah. a way, and still it was the first to adopt AI. That is interesting. And so, yeah, exactly. And why is that? And yeah. we think it is because we started with the ethics. We started with an ethical framework. We started with rather than say, you know, we're going to be the Uber of healthcare, and we'll break it and we'll figure it out, you know, yeah. and pick up the broken piece later. That is very hard to do in healthcare because you will be harming patients right. directly and, and killing people and blinding people. And so rather than being the Uber of healthcare, we say, let's get support from all stakeholders in the healthcare system. And there's many, and I will mention them to you once and mm-hmm. not know yep. anymore. But the, the, <laughs> what, what is interesting about healthcare, because it's so sensitive and be, people care so much about their health and their bodies, there have always been ethics. Like thousands of years ago, maybe the Hippocrates oath, you know, people have probably heard about, Mm -hmm. right? This ethics. Mm -hmm. You see it in every culture around the world. And so there's some principles that we use that allow us to say, well, these issues are probably going to come up in the future. So rather than be reactive, and we've seen it in social media where, you know, we implemented it and now kids are not always doing so well, right? And now we say, oh my God, what did we do? And that's reactive. Right, mm-hmm. you you, True. you yep. see the problems, and now you say, "Well, we need, maybe need to do something." In healthcare and AI, we said these are the problems we are going to expect and see when we implement this uh-huh. racial bias. Uh-huh. We were talking about in 2010, 2012 with the FDA to address it, to test it, to validate it, etc., and we solved it. Yeah. So many other things: data usage, safety, liability. We can talk about all these aspects. Who's going to pay for it? We had to solve that up front rather than being reactive. But let's say we implement AI. Oh, my God, how are we going to pay for this? Well, you know, it's broken now. No, we, we, we set out to address that from the start, and that's what an ethical framework allows you to do. And now we went to all the stakeholders, 
<laughs> you're I did it again. You're I was, fine, you know, you're I'm fine. banging on this desk again. <laughs> and, and so we went to all the stakeholders one by one. And so mm-hmm. patients, patient organizations, physicians and other providers in the organizations, like the American Medical Association, payers, right? The people in many cases who pay for our healthcare, like Blue Cross Blue Shield, True. United, yeah. Medicare CMS, ethicists, AI creators, you know, tech companies even, FDA, FTC, and other regulators. And we made sure that all of them support this. And they do. And so that's why ultimately people say, well, how did it go so fast? Well, we took care of all the issues all of them might have, including Congress, like you mentioned, mm-hmm. like yep. his letter, to make sure that all the issues were addressed up front, that we have an answer and a scientifically valid answer to all of them. I think that made the difference. And now I forgot what, you, what, what started this, but essentially healthcare... Regulation first, should we regulate? And regulation yeah. was there, but it's regulation with the right amount. You can kill it by making it so difficult to do the clinical trial that it costs a billion dollars for every AI. Now, yeah. it will never happen. If you allow it to be too easy, you get all sorts of bad AIs. Mm-hmm. And now patients are harmed and people say, no more. We don't want this. And we need to, you know, we, we have found so far the right balance and we need to continue to find that right balance. And that's really what I'm trying to achieve in, you know, with legislators and other policy makers. And like finding the right balance in regulation in general is very difficult. Uh, I remember a past client who I won't name, but they were in medicine. Um, They had a new version of their technology and it was like half the weight, half the size. It was very slim. And I was like, this is really, really cool. Why don't you guys just push this to market? And he said, Justin, we can't. We don't have the money. Like, what do you mean you don't have the money? I see the prototype sitting right there. You already have a manufacturing partner. How much is the tooling? I know I know what these costs are because I have a lot of clients in medicine. And he's like, well, uh, that's not the problem. The problem is we don't have two and a half million dollars to f- refile through the FDA. And he gave me this speech about how the FDA and regulations can be really great things. They can protect people, but... Also, the FDA can, in some cases, be used as a weapon against smaller startups and companies trying to solve uh, and and make better health outcomes, smaller companies in general. So is there a concern with AI regulation that some of the bigger companies use it to strangle out some of the smaller companies like yours, right? Like, I, I just, like, if you were to go up against some big health company, I imagine that would be a difficult battle. So is that a concern for people in healthcare that the FDA will be used to choke out smaller innovators? Great questions. A few answers and I have to be a little bit... Uh, you don't obviously want the FDA being, being mad well, at you. I, no, 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 no. I cannot speak on behalf of the FDA. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think the people in there want to do the right thing and, it, and, and it's tricky, like you say. I mean, yeah. You want patients to be safe, but if you only go for safety, it you know it stops everything that it tracks. So you can't the ever be perfectly safe. You, you right. can, but if you let it go too loose, people Congress will step in and say no more. And yeah. we, we did it with gene therapy. So this is a real a great example. Point. Gene great therapy point. was going really well in the eighties and nineties. We were starting to treat people. People did unethical experiments. Young people died during trials, yep. and it was shut down for twenty years. And only very recently in retina. We had the first gene therapy approved now a few years ago. So you can really kill a field if you go too fast and too unethical. So I, I don't know about this specific company, and, and that's a concern, but in general, we, we have to be very careful not to go too fast and harm too much and now it's shut down because that is an overreaction, right? Uh, part of it, now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find the right balance. Um, I think FDA is listening to everyone. If FDA, so let me give an example. If mm-hmm. FDA, specifically about AI, was much looser about AI, other people wouldn't trust it. Other stakeholders wouldn't trust it. Yeah. The payers, physicians, patient organizations would say, well, we don't like this. I mean, it may be FDA approved or whatever you're authorized or whatever you call it. We are not going to pay for it. Mm-hmm. We are not going to use it in our clinic. And so you don't really move the needle. So you need all support. We're actually seeing that in Europe, where we had a, it, it's interesting for many AI companies there, because the regulation is, you know, there's not much, but now people don't trust it, and they want to redo the test in every country, in every province, mm-hmm. in every region, want to do their own clinical trials. Well, that's impossible for smaller companies. 
back to the big versus small company. Right. You know, we're an Iowa company. I started it with one person myself. Yeah. So we really, you know, we're now over 100 people, but we're still small compared to some of the companies you probably heard about from the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, one starting with a G. And so we're first, mm-hmm. right? We did it. And so clearly it can be done. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But did you, like, my concern is that you, because you guys were fast. You were doing this years ago. Because Um, we addressed all the stakeholders. Right, right. But you, I mean, you admit, though, that you were pretty ahead of your time. You were working on this long before most people even knew AI was being used in medicine. So I kind of wonder if maybe your speed saved you. Uh, Like, I want to put my cynic and tinfoil hat on because one of the concerns I know a lot of people do have is that very thing is AI being you or excuse me, regulations being used to like stop AI. Even uh, what was it? Elon Musk, who I'm a fan of, I'm a Tesla shareholder. I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll put that in there. But even he was like, hold on, we need to stop AI development until we can regulate this thing after open AI started launching, you know, certain things. And e- even people like him were saying, we just need to stop it for now and, and wait and, and regulate it first. And I'm thinking to myself, Guess who's not going to do that? Like India and China and other countries who are in this AI race, they are not going to stop. They're going to keep going. So um, that's but basically if this is a fair, I want to I want to put a fair summary on this. Um, we this is the time to be very, very careful oh, in yeah. regulating it because we like you said, we need a balance. We don't need to overdo it, but also we need to keep people safe. And that's a delicate balance. And. In, in terms of the international competitiveness, we actually yeah. have an advantage yeah. because the FDA is seen as this, this highest authority in healthcare across the world. That's how people in Europe say it because I, I came from there, as you can hear from mm-hmm. my accent. So mm-hmm. I know what, how people look at it. And the fact that we got this authorization really made a difference in many markets across the world. They say the FDA signed off on this, we're good. Really? And so wow, it's a competitive that advantage that yeah. we have this regulatory oversight that is just enough. If you say, well, did it change? No, I think they're actually, I'm, I, uh, disclosure, I work very closely with FDA on what we call considerations, you know, preparations for regulations on AI. And we actually have one on AI bias. We had another one on, you know, what should the truth be for an AI? What do you compare it to? And so we, I know they're very active in, in how to regulate it with the right touch. I know other companies are now getting AIs approved and authorized. In fact, there's two other companies that already were authorized on our example. And and going back to what you said, yeah, we were the first because we were early, but we also cleared the path. Yes. When I started, no one, including FDA, knew how to regulate this. Now we know. Clinical trial, this is what should probably look like. Workflow, things like you know the operator and, the, and what the expertise of the operator is how you deal with the workflow, how you deal with racial bias, things like that. We know how to sort of do that. It may be a little bit different for new AIs, but we know it. Reimbursement, we know how to do it. We used an equity-based approach for AI reimbursement that CMS seemingly adopted. And so there's a path for other AIs. If you show the benefit, if you show this, if you show safety, there's a path. Mm, I think that's key, right? I I would argue... Yeah, we cleared the path and we were the first and it was, you know, a little bit of a tough road, but now it can be done. People can see it can be done and people are following the uh, example and that's really beneficial. So you're saying like for AI companies out there in medicine, um, because like, again, if you are creating this, uh, this device that screens for all health conditions and it's like $10 at a at a grocery store, like that makes uh, health outcomes accessible for literally everybody in the world. It brings the cost of healthcare down a lot. And you're saying if you are an AI company going into this field, you need to get out ahead of it and show safety and be ethical and show how um, you're anticipating those future needs right now. You need to get, get in, in, get in touch with your legislators and show them Here's how we're doing this right and uh, get out ahead of it is, is kind of what I'm hearing. Lead with ethics. Um, I, I mean, I could probably talk to you another half hour about this topic, but uh, I really appreciate the time. Dr. Michael Abramoff, founder of Digital Diagnostics. If people love what they're hearing and they want to learn more about what you're doing or even I don't know if you're looking for investors for a new round or anything. How do people reach out to you and learn more about what you're up to? You can always go to digitaldiagnostics.com to look, you know, see what we're doing. 
uh, sorry to back to what you were saying. I also represent the Healthcare AI Coalition, mm. which is a group of AI companies, like you mentioned, trying to do the same thing based on an ethical framework, interacting with Congress, with with FDA and others. So Excellent. there is that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but back to myself, you can also find me on the University of Iowa website. So I'm relatively easy to approach it with whatever in DC. Dr. Abramov, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for coming on the Iowa podcast. And thanks so much, uh, Justin, for having me. And to my fellow Iowans, Iowa expats, and Iowans at heart, thanks for listening and subscribing to the Iowa podcast. Mm-hmm.